huge amount of we use a huge amount of our land uh, for agriculture. In fact, about 40% of all ice-free land is used for crops and pastures. So we've uh, modified nearly half of our planet, which of course removes that for use for a lot of biodiversity or other human uses. So collectively, we have a, a lot of impact on our planet from food production. Now you've probably seen graphs like this or information like this in the, in the news or or in the literature where they rank or compare different foods in this case by their greenhouse gas emissions um, during production so you've probably heard a lot about beef and cows as being really bad for climate emissions actually goats and sheep are, are even worse than that we just don't produce as much of those as we do for cows but these kind of comparisons are are what motivated my initial shift towards um, becoming a pescatarian but this is just some foods, uh, in particular, a lot of the seafood from wild caught fisheries and aquaculture are rarely included in these kinds of comparisons. And it's just one issue, greenhouse gas emissions. But as I was just showing you, there are many things that food production does to our planet that we really need to be paying attention to comprehensively to get that bigger picture. So, our work really tried to address three of these key gaps in the current literature that would help inform our thinking and our decisions about what we eat and the food policy we uh, implement uh, in our country and around the world. First, as I've mentioned, this information is really siloed. So it's certain foods, uh, but not all foods, or it's one issue at a time rather than all of the environmental pressures from food production. And we really need a comprehensive and comparable way of measuring the multiple stressors that come from all food together. Second, almost entirely this work has focused in the past on uh, per unit measurement. So the, the amount of environmental pressure per kilogram or per pound, which is fine from a human choice perspective. We only eat a pound of food a day or so, but when you add up 8 billion people and collectively look at the food production to feed all those people, you have to, and understand the impact for the planet, you really need to account for the volume of production. You can have something that's really high pressure, but very little of it is produced and it's not gonna be that big of a problem for the planet. But if you have something that's not particularly efficient and you produce a lot of it, that is gonna have a really big impact on the planet. And then finally, um, most of the studies have not mapped where these pressures occur certainly not all of them together. And these maps um, help provide information on where pressures are greatest and where opportunities are for thinking creatively about shifting food production or reducing food production in places that are having high impact on the planet to help create more sustainable food systems. So these three things are what we set out to tackle with our work and I'll show you um, results that emerged from what we did. So here we start with the stories of what we did to map and the global food footprint and the results that we got from that. Now I wanna show you what we did so that you understand what's under the hood when you see the results. So we looked at four groups of food, livestock. So this is animals that are grown on land, aquaculture, so, um, um, seaweeds, shellfish, and fish that are grown in freshwater or um, the ocean, all the many crops, and then wild-caught fisheries. And within each of these four broad categories of food, we tracked many aspects of production that lead to one or more of these types of environmental pressures. So for example, in livestock, we look at manure, which creates um, greenhouse gas emissions and pollution the feed that goes into those animals that each have their own associated pressures, the land use and infrastructure to grow and harvest those um, livestock, the water that the animals need to drink, and enter enteric fermentation, which of course contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And you can see we have other measures for each of the other food types that we track as we um, look to understand the comprehensive environmental footprint of food production. And for each of these, we look at these four key uh, environmental pressures, greenhouse gas emissions, GHG, 
that contribute to climate change, disturbance of the land or uh, water where the food production is happening, which um, uh, disturbs and removes uh, native biodiversity, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus pollution, and then water use. Now, there are, of course, other aspects of food production that have environmental consequences, but these are the four really big ones that um, dominate uh, food production pressures and what most people pay attention to and measure. So we can look at the contribution of each of these pieces for each of the food types for these four different pressures. So we can take um, another example for crops, fertilizers, and pesticides produce greenhouse gas emissions and nitrogen and phosphorus pollution. So you can see different aspects of different food production have different pressures associated with them. And then we can pull that all together to measure the cumulative pressure of all of these. And we can measure and map the individual pressures and those cumulative pressures to get this bigger picture of environmental footprint of food production. So lots and lots of stuff under the hood, but we combine that all together for 99% of all reported global food production. So there are a few things missing like um, the food you grow in your backyard garden uh, or bushmeat hunting um, in rural areas that uh, we just don't have data on and so we couldn't include in this study. And as I mentioned, we, we account for both the per unit kilogram or, or pound efficiencies of these foods, but also the volume of production and where that is happening so that we really get this big picture of the planetary impact of food production. So I'm gonna share these results in five stories or chapters that are kind of the key take home messages from the work that we've done. So first, as I'll show you, the, food, the environmental footprint of food production is highly concentrated spatially. So this is what it looks like. Again, this is all foods and these four key pressures measured together. And those um, bright red spots are the top 1% of the environmental footprint of all food production. And then you can see the um, kind of muddy brown to light yellow are the um, decreasing footprint of areas um, from food production. So really high concentrations outside those red top 1% across North America, Europe, um, Central Africa, and, and South America, for example. You can also see that it's in the ocean. That's where the fisheries are happening, but also harvest of fish products for other um, food production. And of course, across most of the landscape. But even despite that um, wide distribution, like I said, it's highly concentrated. So that top 1%, those red, red areas, create 40% of the total environmental pressure from food production. And interestingly, uh, the top 10% creates nearly all, 93% of that total pressure. So it's really concentrated in certain areas. And that concentration, is both a positive and a negative. It's a positive in the sense that um, it is uh, pushing most of that pressure into a fewer areas and therefore leaving more of the area uh, less under pressure. But it also means anyone who lives in or near these really high pressure areas is disproportionately feeling the, the consequences of that environmental footprint. We can pull these layers apart and look at the, the maps of the four individual pressures. So I'll show you those as well. This is that disturbance measure. So this is crops and livestock grazing that is mostly driving this. And then that, that faint yellow in the oceans is the kind of the footprint of global fisheries. The nutrient pollution is more widespread. It's really highly concentrated in India, uh, China and Asia, uh, Europe and Central North America. So places we know there's lots and lots of crops uh, and livestock producing nutrient pollution. Water use has a similar footprint, but more concentrated in areas that are um, uh, more arid and, and need more water input. And then greenhouse gas emissions are really widespread coming from lots of places, although still concentrated in these areas in India, China, Europe, North America, and, and Brazil in particular. 
Once we have this information mapped, like you've seen, we can aggregate it up into different reporting units, in this case, countries, to really see which countries and which foods within each country are contributing to these um, environmental footprints. So these 20 or so countries are the top uh, ranking countries in terms of their environmental footprint. India and China are the top two, each contributing almost 15% of the global uh, footprint of environmental, uh, environmental footprint of food production. And they show an interesting story in comparison where you know, India has much higher amounts of uh, environmental footprint for crops for human consumption, that dark orange bar, whereas China has much higher um, environmental footprint from for livestock feed, crops that are put towards feeding animals. So just these two countries tell a different story about how our food production and for what purpose our food production is having um, environmental consequences. And this is only possible because we were able to map where all these different foods are happening. And you can also see uh, the blue colors are where blue and yellow are the, the seafood, marine and, and freshwater fisheries and mariculture. And you can see, you know, those are dominant in places like China, Indonesia, and Russia, but are much, much smaller in many of the other countries that are in this list. Now, these countries account for 70% of the global cumulative pressure. So again, really highlighting the, the highly concentrated nature of the environmental footprint of food production. And the top five countries, India, China, United States, Brazil, and Pakistan, are nearly half, 45% of the the total environmental footprint of food production. Those are big countries, so and partly it makes sense. They're a large part of the, the global landscape, but even that said, they are it's very concentrated in these countries. Okay, the second uh, kind of chapter or story from this work is that uh, this um, analysis we've done produces different rank orders of the foods that are having the largest um, environmental footprint on our planet compared to what you've been probably reading in the news or seen in other research. So um, here's how we um, let me just have, how we um, stack this all together. So we keep track of um, both the direct um, pressure from the disturbance, greenhouse gas emissions, nutrient pollution, and water. That's the top. Um, set of colors, and also the pressure from the feed that goes into these animals. Those are the slightly darker versions of those same four colors. So if you look at um, pig's meat, for example, it is now the top ranking food uh, for environmental pressure. And that schematic I showed you before, it was for greenhouse gas emissions alone, it was sheep and goat meat. For other things you've probably read, cow meat is uh, you know, the highest um, greenhouse gas emissions. And that's still true, but when you look collectively across these four pressures, you see these different rankings emerge. So pig's meat has higher water use than cow meat and much higher nutrient pollution than cow meat. So that when you stack these things together, it emerges as the top ranked um, food for environmental pressure on the planet. You can see that cow's meat is still the highest greenhouse gas emissions producer, the pink color there. It's just that it's lower in, in water and nutrient use and pollution than pig's meat is. And you can see how the other livestock stack up against each other. If we pull in, in this case, fisheries and um, mariculture, aquaculture, you can see uh, much lower levels for many of these foods. Those or, uh, vertical solid and dashed lines help compare equal values because the x-axis has been stretched to show the smaller values on these uh, other foods below. So demersal fisheries um, have relatively high cumulative footprint um, in part or primarily because of the large disturbance of the seafloor that comes from dragging those nets across the bottom but also high climate emissions because of all the fuel that's needed to drag those heavy nets through the water. But most of the other fisheries have much lower uh, environmental footprints on the same order as the lowest of the livestock. And aquaculture, mariculture, besides shrimp, has much, much lower cumulative environmental footprint associated with it. 
And then we can look at crops as well. And we see that rice and wheat are, are quite high. Um, and then you get a strong tailing off across many of the other um, crops. Now, of course, none of the crops have any pressures associated with feed because we don't feed crops. Uh, we feed crops to animals. And so they inherently are gonna have generally lower environmental footprints because they're not being fed anything. So if we look at this all together, those are those plots now stacked on top of each other. Again, those vertical lines show equivalent values across the, the four plots. Um, we stretched the x-axis on the, the bottom ones to spread out the scores. We see um, these new rankings that are probably surprising to many of you. The top five are pig, cow, rice, wheat, and milk which uh, is again, um, quite surprising and driven in, in big part by the production volume of rice and wheat, which I'll get to a bit more in just a minute. Um, importantly, things, uh, fisheries do not have water or nutrient pressures associated with them. They are wild, so we don't uh, need to grow them. So we don't need to add water or um, or have to worry about nutrient pollution from growing them because they're out in the wild. So this inherently makes fisheries uh, have an upper hand on sustainability because there's just fewer pressures associated with um, producing that food. And then I hope you come away from this with the kind of understanding that looking at these pressures in a cumulative way really uh, as, as well as accounting for the production volume of that food production tells a different story. The, the rank order of these foods is really different. And I'll return to the implications of that in just a minute. Okay, the third chapter, the third story I wanna tell brings us back to these efficiency measures, this idea of per kilogram or per pound um, constant environmental footprint of food production because it's still important to think about efficiency as one way of understanding the environmental pressures associated with food production. But what we can do with these efficiencies uh, that is fundamentally different than the vast majority of other research on food production is account for the differences among countries. So what we see here is an example, goat meat, and each dot is a country. So there's about just under 200 dots on this plot. And I've color coded six of them so that you can kind of identify a few of these dots. The red one is India. Uh, the yellow one is United States. The orangish one is Brazil and Indonesia. And then Russia and China are the, the most efficient, uh, the furthest to the left in this plot. So these are inefficiency measures. The further they are to the right, the less efficient they are, and the further they are to the left, the more efficient they are. So you can see there's a huge range of values, uh, efficiency in goat meat production um, from country to country. Now, if we look across um, all of the livestock categories, we see the rank order of efficiencies um, starting to match some of the other rankings that you maybe are familiar with. Again, this is cumulative pressure, not just greenhouse gas emissions, but goat and sheep meat are the um, least efficient. And in this case, chicken meat is the most efficient. But in all cases, there's huge variation. So any one country might be better at um, one food and worse at the other and another country vice versa. And you can see the colored dots that associate those six uh, example countries moving around from food to food, showing how there's huge variation even within a country of different food production and their environmental efficiencies. Now we can do this for the other foods as well. Again, this red line just shows equivalency across the plots. And in all cases, we're seeing um, huge variation among countries. Uh, for any given food production and the rank order of countries changing within the different foods in their, in their efficiencies. But in general, you see the, the average rank order of these foods in their efficiencies um, as you, you move down these plots. So we pull that all together and you can see crops on the bottom there. Um, there's a couple key 
um, take home messages from this. First of all, um, you know, many crops and seafood are particularly efficient. They're far to the left on these plots which means per kilogram per pound, they're having a relatively small amount of environmental pressure associated with them. But as I've said many times, there's really wide variation among countries in the efficiency of any given food. So for crops, we see variation two and a half to eight and a half times um, for any given food. So, you know, you can have an example where, you know, one country can be almost 10 times more or less efficient and another in producing a given crop. And for fisheries, we see this variation up to 22 times difference for any given country, which means the same food harvested or grown in one place can have a much different environmental consequence than that food grown or harvested in another place. So just one example of that is soy production um, in the United States, which is the largest soy producer in the world, and India, which is top five soy producer, and the United States is almost three times more efficient than India. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. <clears throat> we have pretty strong rules and regulations about farming and fertilizer use that reduce some of the pollution pressure. We have a lot of technology that helps um, harvest the um, crop more efficiently. We have access to genetic seeds that make more productive crops and when you grow them and so on. So there's a bunch of um, technological, political, um, environmental reasons that we can grow soy more efficiently in the United States. This is just one example. You can do these kinds of comparisons for any food in any pair of countries you're interested in. And then we also see variation among foods within a country. So for example, in Indonesia, pigs are almost seven times less efficient than cows whereas in other countries that might be flipped. So this is an example where if you really want your meat in Indonesia, uh, you might actually wanna have beef instead of pork if you're interested in environmental sustainability. And then finally, I think it's finally, the, the rank order of countries changes again from what I was showing before based on efficiencies, which really highlights the need to pay attention to how the, the results are being presented, whether it's efficiencies or um, volume of production for understanding the environmental footprint of food. Uh, the last point on this slide is that these differences among countries create um, the potential for policy and trade to guide the food production to be more sustainable and more efficient. So we might choose to create subsidies or incentives for food production uh, with uh, countries that do that more sustainably or um, have taxes or trade policy that limits um, access to food from countries that are less sustainable, for example, or many other ways that we can use the spatial information of how different countries have different environmental pressures associated with them to, at a global scale, reduce the environmental footprint of our food production. Okay, the fourth chapter or the fourth story to tell, I wanna highlight the role of feed in understanding and guiding our uh, decisions about the sustainability of food production and what we eat. So a key part of this story comes from this simple fact that different animals are more or less efficient at converting feed into their own body and what we therefore can eat. So cattle, it can take almost seven pounds of food to produce one pound of cow. For pigs, it's about three to one. For chickens, it's closer to two to one. And for farm fish, it's actually close to one to one. So these conversion ratios have a big influence on environmental sustainability because you just need more land, more crops, more environmental pressure in order to produce the same uh, a pound of, of meat or a, a a kilogram of meat. Um, so that's a key part of it. A second interesting aspect of the feed component of our analysis is that we are more and more feeding all sorts of things to all sorts of animals. And so we're basically homogenizing the feed in a way that makes different uh, 
animals, one, have really large environmental footprints because of the feed, and two, have increasingly similar footprints. So here's a follow-on study we did that just published a few weeks ago comparing chicken and farmed salmon that shows what may be surprising results to you that chicken has a footprint in the sea because we feed forage fish to chicken. About 25% of all forage fish goes to chicken and pig feed. And for salmon, we feed crops, soy and other crops to fish. So farm salmon have a terrestrial land footprint. And we can see, although you know, different to some degree, these two um, spatial maps of the footprint of chicken and salmon, farm salmon, are remarkably similar because of feed. So the feed component creates large footprints and similar footprints for these different food products. So the take home from that is if you don't feed something, it inherently is gonna have a smaller environmental footprint. So crops obviously don't get fed, wild caught fisheries don't get fed, bivalves in aquaculture don't get fed. So these food groups um, have other issues with them for in terms of their environmental uh, footprint, but they don't have footprints associated with feed. All the things that do get fed have this second row of, of pressures associated with, with them that come from the footprint of producing that feed. So let's take an example of pig meat at the top there. You see those red boxes are highlighting the sections of the cumulative footprint of pig that come from the feed. And it's about a third of the total footprint of pig meats is from their feed. Let me take another example at the bottom, shrimp aquaculture. Again, those red boxes highlight the footprint that comes from feed, and it's about a third, again, of the environmental footprint of this food production. So the exact proportion varies, probably a quarter to a third for any given food, but a significant amount of the environmental footprint of fed animals comes from their feed. That doesn't mean we can't you know, continue eating fed animals. Uh, there are things that we can do to uh, reduce the environmental footprint of feed to help reduce the environmental footprint of the fed animal. So there's some really neat things happening in feed innovations that are using other products besides crops and forage fish to feed these animals, things like mealworms or microalgae or single cell proteins, all of which can be grown in a lab and at large volumes. And they can be engineered to have really good um, nutritional qualities like high omega-3 and omega-6 um, proportions that make really high quality food and, and can have uh, much less environmental footprints associated with them. So there are some neat things happening with feed innovation that can help uh, reduce the environmental footprint of, of food production without having to change our diet. Another great example you've probably heard of in the news recently is um, how they have um, started to feed kelp or, or seaweed to cows and reduces their methane emissions by I think 13 or 15 percent um, because uh, they burp less uh, when they are fed seaweed. And so this is a really neat story of how innovations in feed can actually reduce the environmental pressure of food production without having to change anything else. The last chapter of the story I want to tell you about from this work is really highlighting this um, distinction between how we measure food's environmental footprint via efficiency versus production volume. And so this story is told through these comparison of these two plots I've been showing you before. So let's take an example of pig's meat, which we've focused on before. Uh, when you look at its efficiency with the top plot here, it's ranked fourth. So it still has quite a lot of problems with it in terms of its efficiency. And again, huge variation among countries. So it's inefficient and we produce a huge amount of pigs, nearly 800 million per year. And that massive production volume coupled with its relatively high inefficiency makes the cumulative total pressure of pig meat production on the planet, the highest of any food. So again, inefficient plus huge volume 
leads to the highest cumulative total footprint for pig's meat. We can take another example, chicken meat here, where it's actually pretty efficient in terms of certainly the most efficient uh, livestock, but we produce 60 billion chicken per year. It was such a massive volume of production that raises chicken meat to be the fourth highest ranked total cumulative environmental pressure food production system on the planet. So again, stories of how efficiency times volume tells a different story. Just two more examples to focus on crops. If we look at rice, it's um, this isn't all crops. So it's about middle of the ranking in terms of its efficiency. There's ones above it I'm not showing that are less efficient. But we produce a huge amount of rice, about 510 million metric tons per year. And so that leads to rice being the highest crop um, total cumulative footprint of, of any crop. We can look at wheat, which is a little bit more efficient uh, than rice, not a lot, but a little bit more efficient. But our wheat production is just massive, 700 million metric tons per year. And so that um, volume of production raises wheat to be the second most um, highest total cumulative environmental footprint of food production. So again, this combination of efficiencies and volume really helps tell a different story about what's happening. So given all this, what can you do? What can we do about our food choices to help um, the planet and people? Now, of course, there's many reasons people make decisions about what to eat. One of them and what motivated me initially was around environmental sustainability. But many people make decisions about what they eat around animal welfare. They don't wanna eat things, animals that are grown in factory farms. Or certainly many people make decisions about nutrition. What is the healthiest diet to have? Others make decisions based on social justice, which kinds of farming practices are um, you know, not good to their workers versus better to their workers and other aspects of, of social justice connected to food production. And yet others make decisions based on supporting their local communities, going to their, um, their local um, food markets or um, farm share programs. So all of these decisions, uh, reasons for making a decision are absolutely valid. Um, and they sometimes lead to different outcomes. I've been focusing on the environmental sustainability side of that, and that's what I'll, I'll end on. But I'm just recognizing that there are many reasons that people make choices about food and, and they're all good reasons. But based on environmental sustainability reasons of making um, food choices, there are some simple things that can actually make a big difference. So personal choice and what you eat can definitely make a difference. There's individual choice added up with many, many people can make a really big difference. First, if you can eat less farmed meat, doesn't mean cut it out of your diet completely, but if you eat meat, Four times a week, maybe cut it back to three times a week or two times a week. Any of these small changes can make a really big difference. Second, I'd say eat more mussels, oysters, and clams. These shellfish are wonderful. They don't have to feed them. They uh, actually can clean the water of nutrient pollution. They sequester carbon in their shells. They can create habitat for other biodiversity. They're really great food sources and they're super nutritious and tasty. So lots and lots of good reasons to eat those foods. And then another great one is eat invasive species. Uh, so even pigs, which are, you know, in general, not a great thing to eat from an environmental sustainability perspective, in many places are highly invasive. Like in Hawaii, there's tens of millions of pigs and they are destroying the environment there. You can go eat pig there, hunt and eat pig. Fantastic. You're getting a delicious meat and you're helping the environment in that location. So any place that you can eat invasive species, you're doing a, a good thing for the environment. And then there are things we can do with our voice in terms of changing policy. So as you've seen, a lot of these problems are very large scale and require not just our personal choice, but changes in policy level to really make a difference. And that's where our voice can really matter. So engage locally, like try to make a difference in your local community. Uh, bringing awareness to uh, the environmental issues associated with food production and encouraging more sustainable policy at the city or state level um, where you live. 
but also advocate for national change. That's hard, I realize, because you know, what uh, affects national policy is very, very complex. But for example, in the United States this year, 2023, there's the renegotiation of the Farm Bill. This is a huge part of food policy in the United States and can have a major impact on what gets grown where and therefore the environmental footprint associated with that food production. So any way that you can talk to your, your, um, your Congress people or your senators to start to make them aware of environmental pressures from food and think about how to influence things like the Farm Bill can make a difference. So use your voice to try to make that change. So I'll end there. I hope uh, I've given you some useful information to guide your own personal decisions about what you eat, but also to think about how we can make a difference at a planetary scale for really improving the sustainability of food production. And I'm excited for your questions and engaging on this, what I think is a really interesting topic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben. Uh, this was great. And there was lots of great uh discussion too and lots of good questions coming um one quick question someone asked if you're still a pescatarian <laughs> uh so i actually and i've said this to others i started eating chicken because of this i was like it's uh you know really efficient food um but i hadn't had it for so long i've had it a couple times and i've lost the taste for it so i don't eat it anymore so i think it's a i used to eat bacon a lot i once had bacon yeah again and i don't like it as much anymore so i think some of it is uh what you're used to influences what you desire so i imagine that's true i'm very sad about the bacon <laughs> no, um no, no. uh so let's see we have a lot of really good questions um i guess one big picture question for me though is how close are we to something where this could be sort of part of labeling on packages of food um you think there's any chance for that in the next 20 years i you know i'll say i hope so i don't know what influences policy around what's required to be on packages you know more and more is getting included on that and we see you know sustainability um labels of you know like organic or you know um uh the MS, what's the, like the sustainability labels? The, for, right, the Seafood Watch and yes, the Marine and Stewardship things, right, Council, yeah. Right, that yeah. Um, are being added on to packaging, usually as a marketing strategy, but those that are regulated, um, you know, this is the kind of information that uh, is more and more available that would allow for that. Actually, so there's a, a, you may have heard the news of it last year, I think it was in the fall, there was just an amazing study by colleagues of mine that um, looked at something like 52,000 products in, in the grocery store in the United Kingdom and assessed their um, environmental pressures associated with them. They didn't map it like we did, but they took all the ingredients of all the food products and estimated the environmental pressure associated with each of those food products. So they basically developed a method that would allow companies to add these kinds of information onto their labels, whether they are required to or not. I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben. Um, one question that's come up are so how is the relative weighting of the four environmental pressures, um, the water? How did how did that work? Yeah, I skipped the nitty-gritty details in the interest of clarity and message, but it's an important question. So um we scale each pressure to the maximum or sorry, the total amount of pressure um, globally. So any given pixel on the planet is a proportion of the total amount of water pressure or nutrient pressure or disturbance, et cetera. And so the way that we sum those values, the any given pixel is the, the sum of those four proportion values. And so it's a proportion of the total cumulative pressure that exists. So they're all essentially rescaled to the total and then summed. And the that's common for when you're mixing things of different units to make them comparable. If you rescale them to some maximum or total value, that makes them normalized and on a scale of zero to one, basically. And then the summing them is a decision about the relative importance of those. And 
uh, we don't know which is more important. And so we default to equal weighting, but if you wanted a different weighting, you could go in and, and change those weightings. I think this isn't necessarily in that question, but I'll just say, and I didn't emphasize this in the presentation, but we're looking at pressures, not impacts. So uh, these are the environmental pressures that come from food production, but the impact to human health or the impact to biodiversity or the impact to economies associated with food production is a next step. And it's a really complicated one. So we didn't go that next step, but a lot of people think about, oh, food production is having a huge impact on biodiversity, which is true, but we didn't measure that here. These are all the pieces you need to have in order to measure that impact. Um, and understanding how you translate pressures into impacts would determine the weighting you would give to these individual pieces. So the impact to biodiversity is probably greatest from the disturbance measure where you're pushing biodiversity out of a place compared to say climate emissions, which is gonna be less of a direct impact on biodiversity in a location. So if you wanted to use our results to start to model the consequences for biodiversity, you would probably weight the disturbance piece of it more than the other ones to start to get at that, for example. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, I am looking through the questions in the chat and I have to say it's, it's overwhelming. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, I wish we could answer all of them. Um, let's see. There was a question about whether seaweed mariculture is included. Uh, it is, and it is um, like 30% of all miracle. Oh, sorry. No, it's not. Sorry. It, it is about 30% of all um, aquaculture globally, but um, we don't have good information on where it's grown. And so we couldn't map it. Um, and so it's not in this assessment. Okay. Are there any sort of big things like, like what would be the next sort of three steps if, if in a more perfect world where you had all the data you wanted? Um, what would sort of be the next three steps for this work and all the time you wanted and all the yeah. staff people? Well, we actually are doing follow-on work right now. Uh, we, we got some additional funding to take this work, start to look at the environmental justice implications of this. Uh, because we have this information on where the environmental pressures are, you know, the, the obvious question that emerges is, well, what does that mean for who is bearing the, the cost of that environmental pressure the most? And so we're actively looking into questions related to the environmental justice dimensions, and that's forcing us to start to reconcile some of the trade issues that are really complicated that we hadn't dealt with fully in the work I just showed you to figure out once it's produced, where does food go? And that you need, because you know one might expect that wealthy countries would like to export the environmental consequences of their food production to other places. Like so, but to figure that out, you have to follow the trade routes to see if that's really happening. So we're doing that, but um, I would say the next really, the big one is trying to understand the consequences for biodiversity. I mean, I think that's what a lot of, well, certainly a lot of conservationists come into this question with, but a lot of people in general want to understand what this means for biodiversity. You know, we hear about the conversion of the Brazilian Amazon rainforests into cow pastures and soy plantations and the huge loss to biodiversity from that and, and on and on. There's just many stories about the consequences to biodiversity. I think, you know, with the resources and time to take what we've done and what other people have done and, and then figure out what this is meaning for biodiversity would be really powerful. So that would be fantastic. So, and I will, uh, to that note, I'll say like all of our data, uh, everything, all of our code are freely available uh, for anyone to use. Uh, just please take it and do stuff with it. Our hope is that like no one else ever has to do what we've done. This was a lot of work uh, and please like leverage that and then run with it and do these kinds of next generation analyses that really help us move the science forward. Like we, we really hope that this is a, a resource for others to use and do stuff with. That's fantastic, Ben. Thank you. 
Um, there's questions uh, asking about the differences in pressures um, coming from subsistence versus commercial pr production, but also, um, and then an another question, and I'm sure there's a bunch more I haven't been able to read, but uh, differences in production methods. And they said, you know, if you have your feedlot cattle versus your adaptive multi-paddock management of grazing cattle. Can you yeah. talk about how, is it sort of the average of those or is the the more sustainable, for lack of a better word, uh, productions really so small that, like, how, how did you get your information and is it is it sort of all averaged out? No, it's not averaged out. So we, like in the cattle example, we have information on the location and the production volume and the pressures associated with feedlots versus grazing and the, um, to some degree grazing density. And so we were able to account for at least many aspects of the differences in, in how um, cattle are raised. And of course, grazing is a, a much less intensive um, food production method than feedlots, right? But um, we don't have information on like, you know, this farm is, uh, you know, using, you know, 20 kilograms of fertilizer and this farm is using 40 kilograms of fertilizer. Like we don't have that farm level detail on specific production methodologies uh, across each food type. So we, we use the information that's available as best as possible in the different types of food production systems and data that connect that food production to its associated pressures. So for subsistence fisheries, you know, we have the fisheries data by gear type and catch and location, and we know the different um, pressures associated with gear types. So, you know, long dredging or deep trawl gear is, is um, really um, fuel dependent, costs a lot of fuel, so there's high emissions. We have data on that, we can account for that, whereas subsistence fisheries in a small boat has little to no emissions associated with it. And we account for those kinds of differences. So it's not perfect by any means, but we have a lot of data that allows us to track those kinds of larger categorical differences in food production systems. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, so all accounting is done on the basis of the country of production, correct? Is there any sort of way of looking at the country of consumption and right so we do we definitely focus on the country level production and subnational information what maps where within a country different production systems are, are occurring the the consumption side of stuff is what i was alluding to uh, is challenging and we're starting to tackle with this trade information so um like we're partnering jessica gephardt who's part of our team has built an amazing database on seafood trade, one of the most, the most traded food commodity in the world and unbelievably complicated. So she spent the last like, I don't know, eight years building that. And so we were able to leverage all of her work building that trade database. And then we developed within this study, uh, all the information on trade of feed. Um, that's not consumed by humans though, but uh, we had to work really hard to figure that out. But then the trade of where produced food products get sent for consumption is really complicated. So we're starting to tackle that, but it needs lots of people to, to help figure out because it's just, yeah, food commodities get traded to one country, processed, traded to another country, reprocessed, traded to a third country. And so tracking that all down and saying where the ultimate consumption was compared to where it was originally produced is difficult. So that was a very long-winded way of saying it's hard. And no, we haven't done that yet. Okay, thank you, Ben. And sorry, I didn't mean to duplicate uh, the questions. Um, so, I, is there any um, thoughts about looking at too, as 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 climate change progresses, how these th this analysis may change in the future under different scenarios? That is a Great point, and probably would have been the second thing I would have pointed out after kind of biodiversity impacts is starting to think about the consequences of climate change. People are definitely looking into this, so it would be to take what we've done and extend it into the future. It's not easy to do that um, for lots of reasons. We actually have just finished a very, very small case study of that of um, freshwater aquaculture in the United States. 
to understand how climate change will affect that production system. And uh, it took a lot of work just to do that because there's a lot of variables you have to account for. Um, but thinking through how the potential growing range of different food is and what that'll mean for the efficiency and therefore the environmental pressures associated with those changes is complex, but super important as climate change is already having a, a major impact on our, our planet and therefore food production. So yeah, great idea. Okay, thank you, Ben. Um, feel free to say no, but is it possible to share the slides from this presentation? Um, you, you can edit anything you need to. Yeah, it's all published, yeah. so okay. yeah, that's fine. Okay, uh, so anybody who's interested in that, I know there's a lot of you have asked, you can get in touch with me afterwards and I can send them to you. Um, and also the recording will be posted at www.octogroup.org uh, slash webinars. So just scroll down till you see this webinar. It'll take uh, about 24 hours to get everything online. A bunch of pe people have asked about that. Um, and there were so many, there, there's been so much interest and question and discussion. Um, and I don't know that Ben has the time to look at everything. So I'll be pulling together all this. I'll provide it to Ben, all the questions and discussion that have come up. But um, if there are others who are interested in seeing it and any uh, enterprising uh, uh, students who want to use the data and see what sort of questions have come up, um, by all means, get in touch. And that's something that can be that can be shared. Yeah, um, and please reach out directly if you have questions that didn't get answered and or you need help finding information from this work, I'm happy to help connect. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben, for doing this. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone who was attending for participating and sharing your knowledge and interest. And hopefully this analysis is the start of doing better uh, for all of us. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Ben. All right. And bye, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.